Well, good morning, everyone. Blessing to see everyone here this morning. I'd like to ask you, if you would, please open your Bibles to John chapter 19. Uh, By God's grace, we'll finish up our study in 19 as we've looked at the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, What a blessing uh, this chapter has certainly been for me, and I trust it's been for you as we begin to just see the real light of uh, of, of the world as we see it in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we begin this morning, I'd like to ask um, uh, Homer, if you'd open us in a word of prayer, please, brother. You know, as we had begun and we've been looking at this study for some time, it's good for us to always remember it's so easily sometimes we just take our salvation for granted and how simple it is to become saved. And that's a real blessing of the Lord, isn't it? But we must remember the true cost of it. And by God's grace, we've seen that in part through chapter 19. And we know also as we do our study here in chapter 19 that a lot of the details are missing that we would find in the other Gospels. And we've mentioned that the reason for that is we even see John himself, who's the writer of the Gospel of John, uh, he, we don't have any real direct reference to him by name anywhere in it. He wants the focus to be upon our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his deity and his work. And we've talked about how His work is where we're at now. It was about coming into this world. How John the Baptist introduced he is the Lamb of God. He didn't introduce him as the greatest man that was ever going to live, the most moral man. He didn't introduce him that way. Or that he was going to be a perfect man even, in a sense. He didn't go into all of those things. What did he he speak? He talked about him being the Lamb of God. He was the Lamb. And then we see now as he is on this very special day, we'll see in our study this morning, it is this day, a special high uh, high day that they call it, as we'll see in verse, uh, I believe it's in uh, verse 38, but we'll see it in a few minutes. It's also good for us to remember as we begin in chapter 19, or as we look at chapter 19, we're going to begin in, uh, most of our studies are going to be between 31 and the end of the chapter. We're going to begin a little sooner than that in verse 28, picking up a little bit of what we did last week. But you know, in John passes completely over that three hours of darkness that lasted from noon till about three o'clock in the afternoon. In Mark and Matthew 27, 45 says, now from the sixth hours there was darkness over, over all the land unto the ninth. Instead, John draws our attention to the greatness of our Lord, even as he hung on the cross. You know, uh, in, I, I have a Ryrie's reference Bible. I like Schofield. I used to use Schofield all the time. But in Ryrie's, he has a, a lot of things outlined. But one thing he, he has outlined in, uh, I might have been in Matthew, Matthew. I think it was actually over in Matthew when I was looking. But he has outlined that there's actually 34, 34 prophecies that are fulfilled in the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 34 we're going to see a couple of those this morning. I'm not going to go into all those this morning. But think of the improbability and the impossibility of those prophecies all coming about as the Word of God talks about literally hundreds and even thousands of years before they actually happened. Some of them are very minor details, but yet the Bible has them there for a purpose in the Old Testament as we see them revealed in the New Testament just proving that truly, without any question, no one should never ever question the Word of God and its accuracy, even in the smallest of details. So as we consider those things this morning, I think it's a real blessing to us. So we look in verse 28, and it says in verse 19, I mean chapter 19, it says, After this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scriptures might might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now there's one right there, Psalm 69, 21. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Going on in, in our reading in verse 29, it says, Now there was set a vessel of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hispus, uh, hispus and, and put it into his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished! It is finished. We looked a lot at that last week. And he bowed his head, and he gave up the ghost. What's the significance of what I just said there? He, 
he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now, a lot of people have some of the great commentators, different ones, they talk about how the death of Christ, and we know that, you know, when he was pierced, how the blood and the water came out. We'll talk about this some this morning. And say, well, you know, he died of a broken heart. Well, that's probably, in part, he did have a broken heart. No question about that. Maybe in some ways we could look at that. But that's not what, what he died of. He gave up the ghost himself when everything was finished, complete, 100% done perfectly, that he could pay perfectly for your sin and my sin, and it'd be a complete and finished work. That's the significance. And we want to always keep that in mind. It was a perfect work. Nothing needs to ever be added to it, does it? I can't ever try to be good enough. I can't ever do anything in and of myself, but I can do all things through Jesus Christ. And that's, that's the key that we need to be aware of, and that his work was a finished work. And so many today are confused about that. They're still trying to earn their way to heaven. They still think they have to do a little bit more to be with the Lord. The Bible's very clear. We know that the Word of God tells us. It said, For the God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, whosoever believeth on Him shall have everlasting life. There's no adds to that at all, is there? There's only one condition, and that is faith and taking God at His word. It's finished. So him knowing that all things were accomplished, accomplished, Jesus knew his, his great works. His life and death, death work on the cross was fulfilled, and he made preparations to yield up his life and die, having finished his work. And we see oftentimes in scriptures, as we've seen in our previous studies, where they had tried to take the, take, take the Lord, either just arrest him or to kill him, and he would simply say what? It's not my time. It's not my time. But what we're going to get to now is it is his time. And we get to that part now. In Luke 12, 50, for example, it says, but I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? You see, the Lord knew, he knows the end from the beginning, doesn't he? He knew all that his work was about, all that he was going to have to suffer, all that was going to have to happen, but his work needed to be complete. Every jot, every tittle, every perfect aspect of it need to be done for you and I. And that's, that's what he was waiting for. But we see here, it wasn't accomplished, he was still waiting for it. We think of the word straightened here, and it says, it's kind of like how I earnestly desire, and, and, and it will pass. Can we think of the Lord for a minute? His suffering, as we spoke of Mary last week, she saw him suffer all through his ministry. He was hated and despised, and all, oftentimes so many things trying to be done to him. We saw that. But this is the ultimate at the cross. We see this. But all this suffering must be endured. And the anxiety that the time should come. You know, all of us are going to face that time at one point, aren't we? We're all going to come to that point in our life. Death is not an easy thing. It isn't for any of us most of the time. Very few of us just simply go from here into eternity. It happens, but most of the time there's suffering involved with our, with our deaths. We want to remember our Lord and remember the glorious thing that he's looking forward to at the same time as he looks forward to what work he's going to do and what, the, what it's going to mean. To the Christian, death is but an entrance into true life, isn't it? For us, it should be an, an entrance into true, true life. And since the pains of death must be endured, and since they lead to heaven, it matters little how, how soon he passes through these sorrows and rises to his eternal rest, as it should for each of us. Do, can you imagine, and I have to say I'm very guilty of not imagining this most of the time, that we should always be looking up? Shouldn't we? Is not the Lord in control of every aspect of every part of our lives? Is He not? Does He not know what's going on in our life? When we look at our Lord and Savior and think of Him as being the example and showing us what it was to be in the flesh and to live life as a man and see the trials and tribulations and the challenges of the world and a way to walk through those by trusting as He did in His Father, as we are to trust in our Father. 
of knowing that whatever happens, the victory is already ours, that we can withstand whatever may be happening and walk through it with confidence, in love, and in mercy. We have a great gift, my friends, and we need to be in tune because we need it in this world today. People need to see that in our lives. And I'm as guilty more than probably any of you in this room of failing in that area in so many ways. Yes, it was a time when all things were accomplished, when Jesus actually became the target of God's wrath and judgment of sin. We read in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, When he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Wow. Isn't it a real blessing to understand that when God looks at me, he sees Christ. When the Father looks at Bruce, he doesn't see that dirty rag and all the stuff that is attached to all that. He sees Christ. And with him I have been washed in the blood and I am made righteous before God through him. And I can be confident in the day, can't I? Unfortunately, I fail so often in those areas. There was a time after. All things were now accomplished. And Jesus successfully offers himself as the substitute sin for humanity. Jesus did that as we looked at last, last week with a cry of victory in his lips. Who would have thought the crucifixion could ever be anything to be glorified? The most horrible and horrendous death that one could suffer. The humiliation and all that goes along with it. We're not going to go into all that. We talked a little bit about that last week and it was a whole lot worse than that. But yet with God, all things are possible and we have it just opposite of what the world would think. Yes, there was victory. There was no moan of defeat in his voice and no sign of a patient resi uh, just resigning. It was, it was on his terms and it was as he completed all that was to be finished. So what was finished? Well, first of all, our sins were paid in full. Our sins were paid in full on that, on, on that cross. They were, everything was accomplished for you and I to now truly become the children of God again. The types, promises, and prophecies were finished. The sacrifices and ceremonies of the priest were finished. The perfect obedience that he had had was finished. The sanctification of God's justice was finished. Or the satisfaction of God's justice was finished. And the power of Satan, sin, and death was finished. You and I, if you're here as a child of God this morning, have nothing to fear. For the, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, sin was defeated in our life, and death was defeated. And we can be confident in that. But we need to walk in that newness of life itself. In verse 31, we look at the fact that his side was pierced. It says, the Jews, therefore, because it was prepared, because of the preparation, that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for the Sabbath day was what was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Now, what does the significance of a high day? It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a double, it's kind of like a, a double blessing, you might say. What it was is this is a, this was in this particular year, the Passover happened to fall on the Sabbath day, the first day of the Sabbath day. So it was considered a double blessing. That, that was what that was kind of meaning. It was kind of a special day in that sense. But think of the significance of that. Here is the Lamb of God being sacrificed on what day? The high day. The day of the, they begin the Pentecost, which was all about what? His sacrifice. The true Lamb of God now is going to be sacrificed by God's grace for him. Then we read in verse 13, it says, then, then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came out blood and water. Now this blood and water is significant too, because what it means, it means without any question, without any question, Undoubt, uh, uh, undebatable proof of his actual death. 
There's no way that could happen unless he was actually dead for his, for, for that to, for his body to, to, give out, to, to give out that particular way. Yes, we see that. Verse 35 says, And he that saw it bear record. Who's the he here? John, isn't it? It's John. Again, we see him not directly referring to himself, just that he saw, he saw it and bear record. And his record is true. And he knew that he say, say it true. And ye... That, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the Scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be bro broken. Of course, we see that in Psalm 3420 uh, again. We see another one of the prophecies of the Old Testament. When it says in 3420, he kept all his bones. Not one of them was broken. In John uh, verse 37, here we go again. It says, and again, another Scripture said, who shall look upon him? that pierced him. Now we think about the piercing. I always think of the side being pierced, right? But think about it just a minute. He was pierced in a number of ways, wasn't he? The crown that was put upon his head pierced him, didn't it? The blood running down was pierced. His hands and feet were pierced. And then, of course, the spear itself. We see all of this. In, in Zechariah 12, 10, it says, And I will, pour up, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is bitter for his firstborn. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for their son. Looking at that. As Jerusalem is supernaturally defended. Now, this is something that hasn't happened yet. We're going to look a little bit at, at, at the Jewish position here in a few minutes. We're going to see where the world and the attitude of a lot of the world toward Jews. This is an important thing, I think, for us to see this morning. But remember, this is, this is future. But there's going to come that day that the Lord is going to defend Jerusalem when all the world is going to seem against it. Where are we at today? The world is no friend of Jerusalem. Even its best friend, the USA, is turning its back upon them at this point in many ways. I don't know if this is the time, but certainly everything the stage is certainly set. And we need to be true to who we know. And that's who we are in our Lord, Savior, in Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yes, the Spirit is poured out on, all, on the nation. And then at that time, they're going to turn to Jesus, the one they pierced. His head was pierced with thorns. His hands were feet with the nails, and the spear pierced his side. They will look and they will turn from their trust in the foolish and worthless shepherds and turn their focus on the true shepherd, the good shepherd. Just as today, many are following all kinds of false Christ, false religions, putting their faith in a lot of things other than what they should be, the truth, the true God, the only God, the only true God putting their faith and trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, when they see Jesus crucified and understand why he went to the cross and what he accomplished there, we are drawn to him in a most humble and repenting way, aren't we? In John 12, 32, it says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of the world be cast out. All of this that we see in the world, all the evil that's here, there's going to come a day that Satan's going to see his end too, isn't there? And this lower world is going to be set right. And a righteous king is going to sit upon a throne. And he's going, to right, he's going to reign righteously from that throne. And all of the world is going to be blessed through him. And through that time of what we call the millennium. And then it says, if I... Now, this is the Lord speaking. It says, now, now is the judgment. This is the Lord. Now is the judgment of the world. Now shall the, the, the prince of the world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw what? All men unto me. This he says signifying by what death he should die. Again, just another little point. We talked about in our study how nobody seemed to get it when he kept talking about what he was, his, his death and how it was going to come about. So often he mentions it throughout his ministry. We see it in John so often. But nobody really quite understood it. They never quite got it until the end. Then they will look upon him who they pierced. They will recognize that he did it. 
and that he bears, and, and they will recognize that they did, speaking of the Jews, that they did it, and they bear responsibility for it. They're going to recognize that. But it's also good to realize that not only that, but that also um, they, they weren't solely responsible, were they? But responsibility, but, but they had the responsibility nevertheless for the crucifixion of the Savior. They will mourn. The Jewish people will turn to Jesus in repentance, mourning their past rejection of him. The mourning will be deep, as if for an only son, the firstborn. Now we think of firstborn, how significant is that? That's very significant. But it also, it speaks of another thing. It truly speaks of, the, it means the most beloved. It has a love about it that just surpasses all the, the love that we have for the firstborn. And that's what it's speaking of here, the love that they're going to have for the Lord as the firstborn. They, they will fulfill the amazing promise in, in Romans eleven twenty six, And when he said, so Israel shall be saved. You see, my friends, Israel is not going to get wiped off the face of the earth. All those nations surround it today that are looking to attack it, that are looking to destroy it, they may do horrible damage to it. They may even lose their independence. I don't know. But I know there has to be a nation when our Lord comes back. And I know that they can suffer greatly as they have throughout history and continue to do so. But I know that my Bible says real clearly that Israel as a nation is going to be here when He comes back. And they are God's chosen people. And God has a specific plan for the nation of Israel just as He does for us. Now, in the dispensation we're in, it's kind of like a parenthesis put on everything. When we look at the book of Daniel, we see, and then it comes up to chapter 9, it talks about that, that was going to be cut off. And then what they didn't know then, but what we know now is there's going to be a brand new dispensation that came in called the church age, or the age of grace. What a blessing. And in this age of grace, Jew and Gentile are alike. We're saved exactly the same thing, the same way by putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But there's going to be a time that we're going to be raptured out of this world. The Lord's coming back in the clouds and He's going to pull us out of this world. There's going to be a great shout and we're going to be pulled out. And then we know at that particular time another thing's going to happen. That Antichrist that could be very well in the, in the world today will come to power. He's going to have such charisma. People are going to love Him. They're going to think He's got all the answers for this world. He can solve the problems of the world. They're going to put their faith and trust in Him. He's the Antichrist. We know that's all going to be true and that's all going to happen. But we know there's going to be seven years that the nation of Israel and probably us too, well, there's not going to be us because the Christians are all out here, but the world itself is going to experience the most horrible time in its history, as bad as everything has been up till now. There's going to be even a worse time. For seven years, that's going to go on. And during that time, Israel will enjoy a kind of a peace for a brief period of time that will be promised but it's going to be quickly taken from them. They're going to suffer the most horrible kind of things, and then they're going to turn to the Lord. And then our Lord then is coming back. And you know something? If you're here as a child of God, you're going to be in that army that comes back. You're going to be equipped with the greatest of, the greatest of all weapons that you could ever have. You're going to be on a white horse with a white robe riding behind the Lord Himself, who is the weapon that takes everything out. He's going to be in complete control of everything that happens. That's our Lord, and that's what the future is. Let us remember that as we look at the things around us today. It doesn't mean that we are short of responsibility, does it? We are to be faithful in our, in our, in our testimony and who we are and telling those that we have opportunity to tell about what is, the reality of it. Don't worry about whether or not they're going to believe it or not. If you feel led of the Lord to say it, say it. Truly do that. You see, that's God's business. That's God's business. He doesn't tell us, you need to get five a day. Okay, I want you to get five converts a day. You need to witness five times a day. He doesn't say that, does he? But he does say we are to go out in all the world, and we are to preach the gospel. And that's for us too. We're to be ambassadors for Christ. That's what the Bible teaches us. And today it's very important that we see those things. 
Then we see the very miraculous delivery that it will be of that great nation, as we know, with all the world surrounding it. The Lord is going to miraculously come in. We're not going to, that's not our study here this morning, but it's a thing that's going to happen. And then we look at the mystery of, of Israel's salvation. We look in Romans 25 now. Pick this up with me in verse 25. It says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now please notice that last part. Because why? The fullness of the Gentiles to become. So all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodly the ungodliness from Jacob. Who is Jacob? Israel, isn't it? It's another name for Israel. For this is my covenant unto them. When I shall take away the when I shall take away their sins. Now, that's just what we want to think about for a minute. This is a promise of the Lord. The Lord has promised Israel these things, has he not? Does that mean it can happen that way? Well, maybe, maybe not, huh? There is no maybe. Absolutely, it's going to happen that way, isn't it? We know because it's the Word of God. I may not understand how it can happen, but I know it is going to happen because God said it. And we need to remember in Romans eleven twenty five it says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. It's easy. That was one thing that was happening in Paul's time. The Gentiles were getting so filled with themselves and pushing Israel out. And God is reminding them that Israel is still his people. That he's still his people and he still has a plan for them. And they have only been grafted in. There's nothing wrong being grafted in. You know, if you're adopted, that's a pretty good thing, isn't it? Your parents chose you, right? But they are the natural born in a sense. That's who they are. Yes. This is a warning, I believe, to us to take it all very soberly. Christians must not be ignorant of this mystery. We should not be ignorant of it. As we look at the world today, we need to be praying for Israel, for wisdom for Israel, and for the Lord's will to be done concerning His purpose, which it will be. But we should be on that side. This country, I believe, has had the greatest blessings of almost any country that I know of in the history of the world with its two to four hundred year history, depending on where you want to start counting. Why? Because, I believe, of its support for Israel. Because of its love and its basic foundation based upon the principles of God's Word. I believe that's why. But we've moved so far from that and are moving so far away from all of that. And I can see the time of judgment coming in our land very easily. You see, we see God's purpose in allowing blindness in part to come upon Israel. It is so that the fullness of the Gentiles can come in. God's eternal plan, the plan of the ages included the Gentiles. And he's telling us here that, of course, knowing all from the beginning, knowing where Israel was going to be, what they were going to do in the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and turning their back upon him. He knew all of that was going to be. And it was a time there that he had set aside. Now for the Gentiles. Now for the Gentiles, which is, of course, you and I, but also Jews, that a whole new dispensation was going to come in. A new way of administration. And that was going to be through the Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that new dispensation is known as the church. The church in which both Jew and Gentile alike are saved the same way. Through putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That door was open for us. So we know that was part of it. But we must realize it's temporary. It's in part, the Bible says. It's a blindness, but it's only in part for Israel. Only until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. And that day when the Lord is going to take his focus that he has now primarily on the church. The focus on the church. And he's going to take that and now he's going to turn it back to the nation of Israel. He's not done with the nation of Israel. And we know that if we looked at, like in, in, in Daniel, we see how there's also going to be a future kingdom. We read about in the Old Testament, they were so looking forward to that kingdom, but they were confused. They didn't understand the two comings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for one. But they were confused. How could you have a suffering Messiah and a victorious Messiah at the same time? How could all these things be? 
With God, all things are possible, aren't they? And his plan is perfect. And at the point we're at in this world, in this time and place that we are with his Bible and his word in our home, we know the answer. We know he's coming back again. And we know he's going to set up his kingdom this second time around. And he's going to fulfill that promise to the nation of Israel. Yes, they're going to accept Christ. That glorious nation, national restoration of the people will bring in the kingdom age until the, the, until the time of the Gentiles become. At that time, God will once again turn his attention, as we mentioned, to his, the plan of the ages, specifically on Israel again, so that the Bible says all Israel will be saved. God's plan of ages does not set to attend uh, it's not set to uh, it's, it's not set to, set for the attention of everyone equally through all the ages there's different ways that he's administered with different ones but israel will be saved when it says all israel it's speaking of it nationally and it's not speaking of it spiritually and that's important for us to understand because a lot of people think of it spiritually they want to try to write off israel and say that's just spiritual israel he's talking about the Bible's very specific, and Paul is as well when he writes in the book. And we'll see that in just a minute. All Israel is not spiritual Israel. It isn't spiritualizing Israel, or as we see in Romans 11.25, because that Israel is spiritually, it's talking about spiritual blindness. God does, does, does tell us that they are, they are spiritually blind. They are as we see them today. They have a real hard time coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ. They are so locked in to where they are. But it doesn't mean that there are not Jews today that are saved, or does it not? Our friends of Israel are a good example. And, they, and they're out um, uh, ministering to the, uh, to, to the Jewish nation and Jewish people particularly. Now if we looked in Romans, we're going to see how we're, what, what, what the Bible has to say here in Romans 11.25. If you want to flip with me for just a minute there, Romans 11.25. It says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of, the, of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to, uh, to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer and shall turn away the ungodly from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them. When I shall take away their sins, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. For the gift and the calling of God are without repentance. For as ye in times past have not believed in God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. Doesn't that help explain it to you just a little bit? Of our, what we're up against with the nation of Israel, the, the, the Jewish people in general, of where they're at, kind of what their thoughts are, but most importantly what God has done and the reason he's done, he just gives us the whole explanation right there, doesn't he? He's telling us it's quite simple. There's a time for the Gentiles we were to come in. Now we're to be the light of the world, which is what Israel's purpose was supposed to be in the Old Testament. They were to be that light unto the world. But now he's saying, no, it's going to be through the Gentiles, and through the Gentiles, and through that ministry, you are going to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to realize something. The apostles that went out, they were primarily Jewish, weren't they? But the ministry that was most have seemed to be the most effective overall was Paul's ministry. There were still Jews being saved in those days. Paul was also a Jew, wasn't he? But his ministry was unto who? He was sent to the Gentiles, wasn't he? To bring the, to bring the, to bring the word, word. And through that we have the church. You know, God promised that there was always going to be a remnant. We see in Romans 11, 5 when it says, so, Even so, them at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the elect for grace. And if by grace it is no more of what? Works. This is such an important facet of, of our, uh, what we need to understand about salvation. It has nothing to do with works. 
And yet so many churches today are still teaching grace with works. You can't, it can't be grace if it's works, and Paul says that. If it's works, it's not grace. If it's grace, it's not works. So it can't be both. It can't be both. It has to be one or the other. And the Bible's real clear, as we see right here. And it says, and if by grace, then it's no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is no more grace. Otherwise, works is no more work. Is that pretty clear to you? You see the importance of understanding rightly dividing the Word of God and understanding that our grace has nothing to do with us and everything to do with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the cross. And what He did on that, on that day and what was accomplished. But God, we know, has not cast away His, His people whom He foreknew. At this present time, there's still a remnant as we see in 11.27 when it says, For this is my covenant with them when I shall what? take away their sins, it's very clear that they're going to be around. In Paul's day, Israel as a group generally rejected the Messiah. A substantial yet remained, yet embraced the gospel of Christ. And God has often worked in Israel through a faithful remnant as he did in the time of Elijah. We won't go there this morning. Elijah is a good story, parallel in some, some ways to what we see in this situation. There's a distinction between national and and the and the uh, and, and ethical uh, and the uh, a, a, ethnic uh, Israel and spiritual Israel, Paul makes this clear in Galatians three seven and in other passages. You know, like for example, in, as beginning in verse six in Galatians three, it says, "Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness." How was Abraham saved? By grace, really. What he believed God. How were you saved? It's when you believe what the Word of God says. You believe God. You believe that Jesus Christ is God. You believe that when the Bible says that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. We know that that's true and we know who that Word is, don't we? In verse, I think it's verse 12 of chapter 1. How He came and dwelt among us. And then it says in verse 7, it goes on to say, Know ye therefore that they which are that are of faith the same are the children of Abraham, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, even in those days. And the Scriptures foreseen that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall what? Oh, I thought it was just in Israel. What's it say? All nations shall be blessed. Who's that? All. He's the father of both. So, then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Since Abraham was made the righteousness by faith and not of works, Abraham was therefore the father of everyone who believes in God and, and, and is accounted for righteousness through that belief. Nevertheless, God still has a purpose and a plan for Israel and will bring salvation unto them. We also know that this is not a spiritual Israel because Paul says this is what? A mystery, isn't it? What's a mystery? In the Bible, it's something that wasn't known before. It wasn't known until it was revealed at that particular point in time. So the mystery here is the mystery of the church. That's the mystery it's really speaking of. So he talks about that, of this mystery. And it's not the mystery that, this, that, that spiritual Israel will be saved. Some have suggested that the church has taken the place of, of Israel the church is not Israel, and Israel is not the church. They're two different things. Now, in this dispensation, we need to understand that Jews and Gentiles are saved the same way. Remember the word parentheses. It's as if God, just as we see in the book of Daniels, there's a stop, and everything stops. It's been about 2,000 years now. And then at some point, the rest of Daniel is going to pick up as he prophesied, which will be bringing in that, uh, which, will, which, which is the time after we we're raptured out and then the Lord Jesus comes back again. Yes, it's impossible to entertain an, 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 an interpretation which understands Israel here in a different sense from the Israels we see it in verse 25 that we see when it says that ye shall be ignorant of this mystery lest ye should be wise in your own conceit that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Very clear, there's a, there's a stop and there's a go here, isn't there? 
and there's a purpose in it. And once that purpose is complete, then Israel is going to become the main focus all over again. The Lord is not finished with Israel. God has an eternal plan that will be fulfilled. And Jesus returned. And when Jesus returns, that millennial kingdom of 1,000 years is going to be set up. Through, uh, through God, God has turned his focus of his uh, saving mercies away from Israel specifically and unto the Gentiles generally. He will turn it back again. This simple, pas- this simple passage, I believe, refutes those who insist that God is forever done with Israel as a people. And that the church is the new Israel and inherits every promise ever made to the nation and, ethic, and, and, and Israel of the Old Testament. They're not. They're two different ones. It's a false belief to go in that direction. And yet many churches try to say that today. We need to be very cautious. We need to be cautious of those that claim to be Christians and find out what they actually believe. Do they believe that their salvation is through grace and grace alone? Are they trusting in Jesus Christ? Or are they still trusting in themselves in some other work? Are they still seeing themselves as, 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 a, uh, as possibly part of Israel? Still part of Israel? What do you, you call it? Isn't that uh, what? British, yeah. British Israelism? Y'all ever heard that term? Yeah. These are, the, these are realities out there. We need to be very careful. People that are walking around thinking they're saved and they're not. They got their faith in the wrong thing. We are to be reminded of the, of the enduring and, character, and the character of the promises made to the nation of Israel. In Genesis, we see beginning, right at the very beginning of the book, chapter 13, verse 15 says, For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, speaking to Abraham, and for thy seed, huh? Forever. How long is forever? I don't know how many years. It's, how long is forever? It is forever, isn't it? And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee, after, after thee in, this gener- in their generation for a everlasting covenant. It doesn't, have a, it doesn't have an end. That covenant is forever. To be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger. All the land of Cana for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. Has that happened yet? It hasn't, hadn't it? This is the book of Genesis. This concerns the nation of Israel and God's promise that He's going to set up a kingdom and the promise that it's going to be an everlasting possession, the very lands, He identifies what lands those are going to be forever and ever. Yes, God is not finished with Israel and Israel is not spiritualized as the church. While we see the rejection and the continuation of God, God's plan, plan through the ages work, through all of his people through the ages, we also should see the distinction between Israel and the church, a distinction that Paul is very sensitive to in his writings. And when all Israel will be saved, they will be saved through embracing Jesus Christ as their Messiah as unlike, as, as unlikely as this may seem. Yes, they are not saved in some peculiar Jewish way, they're going to be saved the same way that we're saved today, through grace, through accepting Jesus Christ, when they're going to bow the knee to the Lord and recognize who He is. Jesus will not return again and set up His kingdom until God turns the focus of His saving mercies on Israel again and Israel responds to God through Jesus Christ. The Deliverer will come out of Zion. Where is Zion? What's Zion? Jerusalem, isn't it? It's another word for Jerusalem. The quotation from Isaiah shows that God shall have a redeeming work to accomplish with Israel and that it will not be left undone. When he says in Isaiah 127, the Word of God says, Zion shall be redeemed with judgment and her converts with righteousness. 
I'm going to close there because I'm out of time. As usual, I don't get everything said I want to get said. But the Word of God is just so wonderful, isn't it, my friends? It's a wonderful thing to know that our salvation is sure and we can trust in the Lord, no matter what circumstance we're facing out there, because this world isn't our home anyway, is it? And we have a blessing in knowing that He is with us every moment of every day and every challenge and every situation, and we need not be concerned. This world is going to be suffering. We're going to suffer. Life is not easy. Death is not easy. These things are not easy. But just as our Lord was a conqueror and conquered all through the cross and through His death, He looked forward to where He was going to be again, seated in the heavenlies. And we should be looking to that, to that ourselves. And I think when we can see things from that perspective, it will help us with many things in our life as well to do what needs to get done. Pastor Paul, would you close this morning, please, brother?